I was reading the book called Think and Grow Rich, and it had a list of what Napoleon Hill thought was a good list of uh, the qualities and the major attributes of uh, being a leader. And uh, I thought it was such a good list. Uh, I made the list in my own notes. And now the purpose is for me to get my notes into your notes, to get what's in my head into your head, so that it won't stop with you. So that what we share here together today will be passed on, passed on. That's why I do what I do. I do take great pleasure in touching the people that I can see, shake hands with, say hello to, an audience that you can see. But I am also aware of the unseen audience that's being affected by whatever we do. So now I've got a chance to do that. And I think the way for me to be effective with all of you today and then you pass it on uh, to many people beyond what I can see uh, is just an exciting opportunity for me. Now let me give you this list. It's a pretty good list. Napoleon said, number one, a leader needs unwavering courage. And I, I don't know if I totally agree with the unwavering part of this or not, because sometimes our courage does waver a little. You know, bend but not break. Uh, you know, courage mounts up and then sometimes we have the doubts that creep in and we reach a little deeper to find that courage that overcomes our doubts and our fears. So I would probably debate a little bit with Napoleon on this unwavering courage because sometimes courage does waver. But as long as it stays, as long as the, in the end there it is to serve you, uh, the courage to do what you didn't think you could do, the courage to step into territory that might be a little unfamiliar, the courage to talk to somebody you don't know, the courage to attempt conducting a meeting, the courage to give your first testimonial, uh, the courage to uh, you know, solve problems you couldn't solve before, that kind of courage. Uh, the courage to stand up when it's sort of dark in your corner, the courage to do it when it isn't going your way seemingly, uh, the courage to try to have a good day in the midst of a bad day, that kind of courage. Wavering a little at times, yes, because we all have doubts that attack us. We all have uh, small fears that creep in. That is the nature of life. But that's what faith is all about. That's what courage is all about, to serve us when our doubts will not serve us well. Faith to overcome fear and courage to overcome our doubts. But that is a good quality, a good attribute for a leader, and that's unwavering courage. Second, Napoleon said, self-control. That, of course, is the very essence of life itself, is self-control. Because we all have this warfare going on. You know, it's going on in the world, the warfare between liberty and tyranny. Uh, in our own body, the warfare between health and illness, the struggle is on. Uh, the struggle between light and darkness, the struggle between good and evil. I call it opposites in conflict. And as soon as you're born into the world, as soon as you find yourself and discover yourself on this spinning planet headed somewhere, you know that this exists. Uh, to be a civilized society, we must drive the dark side of our nature into a small corner and let the positive side flourish. Uh, early we must learn to exercise self-control. Uh, power is a wonderful thing, but it must be exercised properly. It must be exercised to benefit, not to destruction. So self-control is certainly necessary uh, to be a strong leader. So that you can become the best example. The example of having your temper well managed, to having that dark side of your uh, nature under control. The best example of choosing wise words and not being careless, that kind of control. Uh, control of your appetite, control of your uh, desires so that they fit into the positive side of life and not the negative side. Self-control, very important. Then he said a leader must have a keen sense of justice. How very true. Justice we become familiar with, you know, even when we're small. When certain things that happened or were done to us that we 
something told us that wasn't right. Something did us, someone did us wrong. We have that sense of right and wrong, and it starts very early. Then we have to have that sense of utilizing what's right and what's wrong so that we develop this sense of justice, this sense of being fair, this sense of being on the positive side, on the right side. Uh, to minimize a person's mistakes, they need to have this sense of justice. Uh, we have to have justice when we're building an organization. You know, what's fair? What, what is a good balance? Um, the marketing system that Mark put together uh, has to be fair for everyone. If you have a customer and you take care of that customer, someone else cannot come along and, and take that customer. The same is true with the distributor. Certain rules and regulations so that all of us have a chance to fit within this framework of fairness, justice, and what's right. Otherwise, enterprise cannot work. Otherwise, we have what we call in a political sense anarchy, where there is no justice, when um, might is the order of the day, power is the order of the day, not the law, not the rule, not what's right, but power. And we would all dismiss that. It's been a catastrophe in the last 6,000 years, uh, the governments that resorted to power instead of democracy, that resorted to intimidation instead of freedom. And we all know the terrible toll that that takes. But it takes a toll not only politically in a country or politically around the world, but it takes a toll even in enterprise. It takes a toll in school if a teacher is unfair. It takes a toll in working on a team where someone is unfair or where the leadership is not fair in the administration of justice. So this is true, a keen sense of justice and what's fair and what's right. Part of this we have to learn as we go. You know, you don't have it all the first year. You haven't got it all the second year, the third year. After all the years that I've, you know, been around, uh, both as a human being and as a, as a business person, we're still, even at at these years, trying to decide what's best, what's fair, what's right, uh, to give balance to our life and to build on a firm foundation for the future. So I agree with Napoleon, good idea, a sense of justice. Here's another one he said, definiteness of decision. Indecision is the thief of opportunity. If you don't decide, the opportunity could slip away. If you don't decide what you're going to do today, the day could get away and you're not very effective. I talked about in my recent travels uh, about time management. And here's one of the best ideas of time management. Don't start the day until you have it finished. Is it possible to finish the day before you start it? And the answer is yes. If you don't finish it to the best of your ability, have some idea, some good plan. Sure enough, the day escapes. And in the morning you say, let's see, what should I do now? In the afternoon you say, hey, time's getting away from me. What should I do now? And now most of the day is lost. Most of the day escapes not being utilized and uh, doesn't work for you simply because uh, you didn't make those decisions early at the early part of the day. The decisions we make in the early part of our life sometimes last for a lifetime. The early decisions that you make about what you're going to do with your life as far as herbal life is concerned, those decisions are vitally important. If you neglect them and don't make them, sure enough, the time passes and the opportunity sometimes is diminished and sometimes you spend a lot of time now catching up simply because you didn't make those early decisions. So it's the decisions at the first of the day, it's the decisions at the early part of the month, it's the decisions at the early part of the year that greatly determines what kind of year you're going to have. The, the decisions you make in the early uh, days of your marriage, sometimes those are the decisions that affect the marriage for a lifetime. The decisions you make at the first chance you see opportunity, those decisions, what you're going to do with it, how far you're going to take it, what it's going to be uh, meaning to you in the years to come, those early decisions are vitally important. Then we need decisions to correct poor decisions to overcome our mistakes. It's possible, of course, for all of us to make unwise decisions. 
And at the end of one year, at the end of one week, one month, or at the end of a few years, we say, that decision cost me too much. Cost me a lot of time, cost me a lot of money, uh, cost me maybe a good relationship, uh, cost me a chance to be productive. But as long as you're alive, there's still a chance to use new decision power to correct the mistakes of decisions that were bad in the past. All of us have the opportunity to do that, but I think Napoleon was right here too. You got to be definite in making decisions so that the opportunity doesn't pass you by. Take advantage. Here's the next one. Napoleon Hill said, a good leader has definite plans. How important that is. And of all the years, I think, to cash in on Herbalife's momentum and make some plans for the future, this has got to be one of the greatest years. Herbalife in these 18 years now has created some incredible momentum, not only in opening up the countries, but momentum in the refinement of our marketing, uh, momentum in uh, developing new products, uh, momentum in developing our support system. The key is now for you to make plans to ride on that momentum. Herbalife is like the tide that comes in, and the rising tide lifts all the ships if they're in the water. If your ship and your boat is not in the water, even though the tide comes in that would lift all the ships, uh, if yours is not in the water, then it doesn't benefit you. So here's what you should do. Have the same intensity to make your plans for the future as Mark Hughes has, as the president's team, chairman's club especially, make the plans for the Herbalife company future. You've got to now make your plans. Uh, don't let this momentum pass you by. Don't let this momentum go uncashed in on. Uh, don't let it be like a lost cause for you. And maybe you've, because of the lack of plans, have lost a month or two, or you've lost a week or two, or maybe you've lost a year, and you were 10% effective instead of 100%. Now's the time to change all that and start making some plans. Your Herbalife plans, they're vitally important. You might as well cash in on the Herbalife plans for world expansion, the Herbalife plans for expansion within your country, uh, the Herbalife plans for the expansion of the business, the incentives, you know, cash in on that, capture that, and say, I've got to have some plans that match Herbalife. Not necessarily match Herbalife in numbers, but that can match Herbalife in momentum, that can match Herbalife in cashing in on the opportunity, your plans for Herbalife expansion. You gotta have some plans for your family, right? You got to take your family along, don't leave them out. One of the challenges all of us have in making our plans is how to balance everything, uh, to make sure that we don't regret at the end of the year, I spent too much time on that. I spent too much money. And then if you have, say, how can I not do that again? And construct some better plans uh, so that you won't have any regrets at the end of a year to come, five years to come, three or four, five years to come. Definite plans. The plans for the use of your money. One thing I've admired about Mark Hughes since I've met him all those years ago, once he started becoming successful, he had a splendid plan, not only for his personal success in terms of financial security, but in terms of the company. Because Mark has to look after the company and make sure that the company is secure, that the company has plenty of reserves, so that no matter what happens around the world, and when you're doing business in 37 countries, you can imagine what the challenge is to make sure the plans for each country are there, the backup plans, uh, the financial plans, as well as products and opportunity and marketing. It is a challenge beyond comprehension to most of us uh, what kind of planning that takes in terms of trying to make herbal life secure for the future. I described it in one of the summit classes as Mark takes the same pledge that the President of the United States, the United States takes, and that is to preserve and protect and defend the Constitution, says the President. But Mark has to preserve and protect and defend the company to make sure it's viable, not just in America where it started, but all around the world in each country. It's an awesome responsibility. But now for you, your plans, your plans to be financially secure, 
If you're starting to make some big money in Herbalife, I'm telling you, you got to have a good plan for your resources so that you find yourself secure regardless of what happens. I agree with Napoleon here. You got to have good plans. One more on plans, and that is the plan for your personal development. The plan to be better this year than last year. The plan to take the classes, attend the, uh, the workshops, do everything you possibly can to show personal progress, not just financial progress, not just the progress of having one more car or one more home, but the progress of personality, the progress of communication skills, uh, the progress of recruiting skills, uh, the progress in how to deal with people, progress in using your influence so that it multiplies its power by five by 10 versus what it used to be. You need those kind of plans. A plan for personal growth, personal development, a plan to be all that you can possibly be in the years to come as you develop your Herbalife business and your life business and your family business, all of that, gotta have good plans. Next, Napoleon Hill had a good saying. It was something my father had and passed it on to me as a good philosophy. And here's what he said. A good leader has the habit of doing more than what he gets paid for. What an incredible philosophy this is. The habit of doing more than you get paid for. It's what we call the service that you put out like seeds in the ground that doesn't bring the harvest immediately, but the harvest is yet to come. It's called like putting out the capital in capitalism. Uh, doing more than you get paid for means that you're getting ready for the next move up. Because if you do more than you get paid for, you've made an investment. Uh, the average person might think if I do more than the company requires, uh, you know, then they're ripping me off. You know, I'm not getting paid for that extra time, that extra attention. But you must not view it that way. You must say, I'm getting there a little earlier, staying a little later as an investment in my own personal future because I want that kind of reputation. I want that kind of philosophy to work in my life. Do more than you get paid for. And this philosophy works incredibly well in herbal life. You make the herbal life sale of the Herbalife products, now you must do more than you've gotten paid for, right? They've got the product, you've got the money, but you can't stop your investment there. Now you must develop the investment in time, effort, and energy in turning that new customer into a testimonial. And sometimes that's the most difficult work, the work after the sale, because the sale might be fairly easy. Someone says, hey, I've been looking for this product, I need it, here's my money. But now you've got to stay with them, make sure they don't just buy the product, but that they use the product. And that they don't just use the product, they keep using the product. That's the work after the sale. But if you learn to make that kind of an investment and do more than you get immediately paid for, the payoff in the future can be fantastic. Because as we all know in Herbalife, what really pays off is not a sale of the product. What really pays off is a testimonial. A testimonial that gives you more sales than you can keep up with. A testimonial that takes you places you could never go by yourself, introduces you to people you'd never see on your own. That kind of investment is so powerful. So you do more than you get paid for up front. It's happened for me, making the investment. When I first started lecturing 36 years ago, I talked to high school classes, college classes, uh, service clubs, and I gave it all away. I went and talked for free. Someone said, Mr. Owen, would you come and do this breakfast talk? I said, sure. Uh, could you do this luncheon talk for this service club? I said, of course. And all of that in the beginning was for free, primarily because I'd made my fortune. You know, I didn't need the money, but um, I did it for free. But look what it's made for me by giving that kind of service in those early days and finally it led to business and led to an enterprise. And I was giving the seminar all those years ago here in Los Angeles and Mark Hughes was in my audience. So what you don't get paid for, don't worry about that. Just render the service with the vision of the future that it'll come back multiplied if you have this kind of habit, this kind of philosophy. Next, 
Napoleon Hill talks about personality. You need a pleasing personality. There's many parts to your personality. One is your working personality. You know, the kind of behavior, the kind of attitude that you need, especially in the public. Some things you can kind of get by with, being a little careless, maybe in private, but in public, where it counts so much in your paycheck, it counts so much in building your business for the future, your own personality. But here's what you also must remember. You develop your personality in private so that it serves you well in the public. Sometimes we get the mistaken idea, I can be careless with just these few and be more careful when I have a thousand. But see, that doesn't work that way. Careless with a few, sure enough, that will creep into your presentation for a thousand people. Here's the best practice and the Herbalife opportunity in our marketing systems gives you the best chance to do that. Uh, the influence you have one-on-one, -on -one, that's what really counts. You say, well, I'm only talking to two people, it doesn't matter much. That's when it really matters. Because if you'll practice well there, using your personality, using your influence, to get someone's attention, to get them to listen, uh, to get them to participate, the kind of personality that someone says, I'd like to be around this person. Uh, they're unusual. They're not like the average person I meet on my everyday experience. That kind of personality. But you've got to practice it behind the scenes. You've got to practice it one-on-one. -on -one. And if you're effective one-on-one, one-on-three, one-on-five, one -on -one, I promise you, that will get you ready uh, to now perform with the kind of personality, the kind of charisma that wins people when you're in front of 500 people, 1,000 people, 5,000. So this is a good point, working on your personality. Here's the best gift you can give someone, and that's the gift of attention. Attention is so powerful. When I was a young man, I met Nelson Rockefeller, one of the richest men in America at that time. He's gone now, but he was a unique individual, ran for vice president of the United States. And I had a chance to be where he was holding a press conference. And I got close enough so that when he walked out, I had a chance to step up, right, when security was not all that severe in those days. And I had a chance to put out my hand, shake his hand and say, Mr. Rockefeller, my name is Jim Rohn. And what I remember most was the attention he gave me. With the lights of the cameras around and everybody all around, he looked right at me and said, Jim Rohn, where are you from? I said, Idaho. He said, I really like Idaho. It's one of the, my favorite states in all of the country. And for just a few seconds, he gave me his attention, shook my hand. I'll never forget the handshake, right? One of those multi-million dollar handshakes. But I'll never forget that personal attention he gave me just for a few seconds. It was powerful. Made an impression on me that's lasted until this day. That's why I remember to tell the story. So, same thing you can learn to do. Utilize your personality, utilize your influence, give people the gift of attention. Here's the rest of my list now as we finish up. Next, Napoleon Hill said a leader needs sympathy and understanding. We have to develop that early in our lives. All of our lives, we have to look at those that are less fortunate than we are those who need a helping hand, and especially now we learn to look at those who need an opportunity, those who need a change in their health, those who need a change in their life and in their lifestyle. It's this kind of sympathy and understanding that drove Mark Hughes to construct the company. It took that kind of understanding, that kind of sympathy, that kind of deep emotional feeling. Then Mark understood what it meant to be poor. He understood what it meant not to have. He understood what it meant to be short on finances, on resources. He understood what it meant to lack, you know, a full formal education. He knew all of those lacks. And instead of crying about it, he said, what I will do is change it for myself and then I'll help other people that have the same challenge. Lack of education, lack of the money, lack of the resources, lack of good health, faced with all kinds of difficulties they can't solve. I'll get mine solved and then I'll be strong enough and have the skills to where I can help other people. That kind of leadership quality is so powerful. That kind of understanding. 
Here's the next one. A leader must have, Napoleon said, a mastery of the details. How very true. All can be lost with just a couple of missing details. On the trip to the moon, everything has to work, right? There's a thousand, several thousand moving parts. There's several thousand pieces to the project of getting to the moon and coming back, and all of them have to work. You can't have 10% of them working, 90% or 80%. They've all got to work. And then there's the backup systems for something if something goes wrong to back it up. That kind of mastery of detail is so vitally important. But here's what else to remember as far as Herbalife is concerned. The drama is in the details. Someone says, you know, I lost 30 pounds. Well, 30 pounds is 30 pounds, but that's not the drama. The drama is where were you before you found Herbalife? How did you feel? What kind of circumstances? Now someone begins to give us some of the details. And then after they've lost the weight, now how they feel, now their self-confidence has been restored. Now they feel better about themselves. The drama is in the details. But this is also important in the details of your day, the details of your business, uh, the details of good communication. Master the details. Good advice, Napoleon Hill. Now here's the next three. Willingness to assume full responsibility. All of us have been taught that, especially these herbal life years, to take full, 100% responsibility. Mark Hughes says, what happened to me might not have been my responsibility, but what I do about it is my full responsibility. I've had some things, some people did me wrong. In his first couple of business experiences, he was done wrong. Some people ran off with the money. He was left holding the bag. But he said, that's what happened. And I was not responsible for what happened. But I am responsible for saying to myself, now what am I going to do about what's happened? If a hailstorm destroys the farmer's crop, he wasn't responsible for that. But his responsibility now begins when the hailstorm is over, when he asks the question of himself, what should I do now? Now that this catastrophe is over, now that the damage is done, now what should I do about it? And a philosophy I've taught all these years, it's not what happens to you that determines your future. It's what you do about what happens that determines your future. And this is a major part of it, accepting full responsibility. If you've got an organization, you're conducting meetings, and you're the leader, the responsibility ends with you. Someone else may mess up, make some mistakes, still your responsibility. Some things over which you have no control, understandable. But what you do about it now, how you fix it, the diplomacy you use, the strategy you use, that's the kind of responsibility now that depends on you. Also, you've got to be responsible for your future. Nobody's going to fix it. No one else is going to design it. No one else is going to come along and say, hey, I will make sure it all works well for you. You've got to take all the input. You've got to take all the testimonials, all the teaching, all the training, all the influence. Then you've got to have the responsibility of designing your life. You can design a life of prosperity or you can design a life just to coast and get by. The responsibility belongs to you. Now here's the last two. Next is cooperation. One of the great things we learn in Herbalife is how to cooperate so that we take advantage of each other's ideas, we take advantage of each other's input, we take advantage of each other's enthusiasm, we take advantage of each other's testimonial, and we take advantage of each other's willingness to grow. That kind of cooperation has built Herbalife. In those early days, Mark got the group together. Jerry Shatanovich, Doug Stunts, the rest and made some plans to cooperate. Said, no telling what kind of powerful meetings we can have if we work together. No telling how many people we can affect, even right away, if we work together. You do this part, you do this part, I'll do this part, we'll make it work together, and we'll get the ball rolling. There's an ancient phrase that says, if two or three agree, nothing is impossible. If they agree on the same project, if they agree on the same vision, if they agree on how to get there, I'm telling you, nothing is impossible. Nothing can stand in their way. Just two or three. What's exciting about Herbalife is now we have more than two or three. 
The president's team now is well populated. Even the chairman's club is growing. The millionaire team is awesome in its numbers as well as in its power. And the cooperation between all of us on the tabulator teams as distributors, home office, support staff. 15th floor, wherever we come from. If we cooperate, there's nothing we can't do. There isn't anyone we can't touch. There is no country we can't finally get to with this incredible story. Cooperation, that's why I'm here. Wanting to do my part, HBN, send out some ideas, give you some notes to take, something to think about and ponder, something to talk about with the people that you associate with and are building your business. That kind of cooperation is gonna make this a powerful year. It'll get us to the two billion, three billion, five billion. But it'll get us to much more than just those numbers. It'll get us to a place of honor, respect, prestige, influence, feeling good about ourselves for the hard work that we're doing cooperating with each other. I wanna cooperate with you, helping build your business. All of us cooperate with the support system of Herbalife. We're on our way. We will have the billions. We'll have the stories. We'll have the experiences. Now here's the last one. Napoleon Hill said, a major attribute of leadership is vision. Vision is in many parts. One, a vision for your own course to follow. A vision for you, for yourself. A vision for your financial future, a vision for your health, a vision for your wealth, a vision for you to latch on to and make something out of, a vision for your family, because vision must now lift others as well as ourself. Guess what our family is counting on? That we'll be able to see things that at first they cannot see. That we'll be able to look further into the future than perhaps they will be able to look. The same is true with your organization, the people that are around you. They're counting on your vision. Perhaps you've been there a little longer than they have. Maybe you've been there a lot longer than they have. And they will look to you to help them see things that they can't see in the beginning. And if you will do that, develop that attribute of leadership, I'm telling you, you'll have such a dramatic effect on your organization, it will be unbelievable. A vision for yourself, a vision for your family, a vision for your organization, a vision for the people that you're close to. The old prophet said, without vision, we die, we perish. Unless we can see into the future, life loses its meaning. Unless we can look further than just where we are at the moment, then we have no reason for faith, no reason for activity. But if we'll develop this skill beyond any other skill, I'm telling you, it will help us touch people because they'll want to be around us, because we have this look into the future. Not only the short-range vision of what we're going to do this week, this month, this year, but the long-range vision like Mark has taking us to the five billion. You can have a vision that will take your organization into the future and bless everybody with success. Here's the big challenge of life. You can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. That's the challenge. And of course, the other side of the coin reads, unless you change how you are, you'll always have what you got. I have found in my experience that income does not far exceed personal development. Now, sometimes income takes a lucky jump. But sure enough, unless you grow out where it is, it'll usually come back where you are. Life has strange ways. If somebody hands you a million dollars, best you become a millionaire quickly. So you get to keep the money. Otherwise, sure enough, it'll disappear. Somebody once said, if you took all the money in the world, divided it up equally among everybody, it would soon all be back in the same pockets. Incredible. Success is something you attract, not something you pursue. Success is looking for a good place to stay. So instead of going after it, you work on yourself, personal development. See, the major question to ask on the job is not what are you getting? The major question to ask on the job is what are you becoming? 
the big question is not what am I getting paid here the big question is what am I becoming here because true happiness is not contained in what you get happiness is contained in what you become so that's our major subject for tonight personal development of all the assignments Mr. Schof gave me at age 25, this was probably the most difficult. In fact, I'm still working on this one. I think it's an unending challenge to see what you can become. The next subject is called Basic Laws. And it's good to study the basics. And I call these basics primarily because they come from the Bible. Now, I'm not a theologian or a minister, and that'll be apparent. But Mr. Schof taught me that the Bible was a good textbook for ideas and stories and success equations, how to live the better life. I found out that was true. He also taught me that the Bible is as practical as it is spiritual, and I found out that's true. If you look at your bank account and your income and you're not happy, there are several places in the Bible to check to see what the heck's wrong so you can make the changes. And we're going to cover some of those tonight called basics. Okay. The next subject is my favorite, setting goals. Mr. Shelf taught me how to set goals. What a favor that was. One morning at breakfast, shortly after I met him, he said, Jim, let me see your current list of goals and let's go over them and talk about them. He said, maybe that's the best way I can help you get a better direction started. And I said, I don't have a list. He said, well, is it out in the car or home somewhere? I said, uh, no, sir. I don't have a list anywhere. He said, well, young man, that's where we got to start. He said, I can tell you right now, if you don't have a list of your goals with you, he said, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars, which he did. And that got my attention. I said, you mean my bank balance would change if I had a list of goals? He said, drastically. That day I became a willing student how to set goals. And sure enough, learning how to set goals changed my life. And I often wondered why no one had ever taught me how to set goals up until age 25. I went to high school, but if they offered it, I missed it. I went to college for a year, never heard it. I worked for Sears. <laughs> really? And to my knowledge, Sears never taught it. Right? How to set goals. So here I am, age 25, married, my family starting, I've been to college, I'm working, and I still don't know how to set goals. But fortunately, when I was 25, I met the man who taught me how, and it revolutionized my whole life. Economically, socially, personally, it's incredible. So I want to share with you tonight what Mr. Shove shared with me, how to set goals. It can be a life changer. Okay. The next subject is the negative part of the seminar. Life is part negative, so we got to talk about the negative. And this subject is called diseases of attitude. Diseases of attitude. There's a lot of things that can wreck your chances to do well. We live in a rather dangerous world, so you've got to be not only wise, you've got to be careful. Now, attitude diseases are just as bad as physical diseases, right? High blood pressure, heart trouble. I mean, a lot of things lace your chances to do well. So you've got to be careful. And attitude diseases are deadly. I mean, they'll destroy all the good things you start. Okay. So we'll go through those attitude diseases, how to spot them, how to look for them, what they are, and, and the cure. And I'm a pro on these because I've had them all, so I can give you excellent advice on these. Now, the last subject we're going to consider tonight is called... The day that turns your life around. The day that turns your life around. And under this subject, we're going to talk about the emotions that can change your life. Human beings are emotional creatures. And emotions are powerful for life change. Now, of course, emotions are so powerful, they can go either way on you. Emotions can either build or destroy. So you really have to employ emotions properly. We call civilization the intelligent management of human emotions. If you can intelligently apply your emotions in the right direction, no telling what can happen. Could turn your life around one day would be sufficient. So we'll talk about those. Okay. Now that's a lot to cover in one evening. But uh, we'll keep at it here and see if we can't get it all done.
I'd like to have you now jot down the theme of the seminar. Every seminar should have a theme, I guess. We've got one. It's on some of our literature if you happen to notice it. But if you didn't, for your notes, here it is. The theme of the seminar. It goes like this. The major key to your better future is you. That's the theme of our seminar tonight. The major key to your better future is you. And I'd like to have you underline two words just to give it some added punch. Underline the word major and the word you. So that it reads, the major key to your better future is you. Now my first suggestion is, transfer this to a card or something where you can put it up, where you can see it every day. Preferably put it up where you can see it at the beginning of the day. Before you go off to put the day together, this is a good phrase just to glance at, to keep in mind as you're putting the day together. It's called the silent seminar. If you'll just let this talk to you during the day, I found it to be tremendously helpful. The major key to your better future is you. <coughs> For a big share of my life now, I didn't have uh, this one quite figured out. Among a lot of things I didn't have quite figured out. Many things used to puzzle me back in those early days. I used to wonder why two people could work for the same company, one make twice as much money. Now see, that used to puzzle me. And maybe they were the same age, graduated from the same school, live in the same community, work for the same company, with the same products and the same services. They've got the same traffic, the same problems, and one makes a thousand a month, the other one makes two thousand a month. Now that was my puzzling question. Why would this long list be the same and the money twice as much? I asked, what's the difference between a thousand a month and two thousand a month? And I don't mean a thousand a month, right? I could figure that out. But what, what makes the difference? Why would one person do twice as well, three times as well, speaking economically? Now I know there's more than one way to do well. I understand that. But in this little narrow area called compensation, what's the difference? Well, back then, with my faulty thinking, I'm trying to reason it out. I thought, well, maybe time makes some of the difference, right? Some people do better because they have more time. I used to say, Harold ought to be able to do well. He's got a lot of time. If I had all of Harold's time, I could do well. Now, that's got to be dumb, right? Number one, you can't get somebody else's time. A guy says to me one time, he says, you know, if I had some extra time, I could make some extra money. I said, then forget it. There isn't any extra time. <laughs> hey, when the clock strikes 12 midnight, that about wraps it up, right? I mean, you can look around the gongs there for a little more, but it's over. You say to the guy, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for extra time. See, they'll come and take you away, right? <laughs> there isn't any more time. Now, if you can't get more time, which you can't, what could you get more of that would make a difference in economic results? And here's the key word. Make it a part of your notes. We're going to consider it tonight. The word is value. And I have a little phrase for your notes. Value makes the difference in results. Value makes the difference. You can't get more time, but you can create more value. Now here's the first lesson of economics. Everybody should learn it from the time they're old enough to understand what a dollar means. How to earn one, how to get one, how to keep one, what to do with it. First lesson of economics. We primarily get paid for value. That's lesson one. Bringing value to the marketplace, that's how you get paid. You don't get paid for the time. I know it takes time to bring value to the marketplace, but you get paid for the value, not the time. Now, since that's true, here's one of the key questions of the evening. Is it possible to become twice as valuable at the marketplace and make twice as much money in the same time? Could you become three times as valuable? Make three times as much money in the same time? Is that possible? The answer is yes, if. And it's always if, right? Life is known as the big if. Harry Truman once said, life is iffy. 
How true. And here's the big if we're going to consider it tonight. It's possible to do much better at the marketplace if you go to work primarily on yourself. And that's the theme of our seminar tonight. Learning to work primarily on yourself. People have asked me for the last 24 years, how do you develop an above average income? And the answer is, become an above average person. Develop an above average handshake. Some people want to be successful, they don't even work on their handshake. As easy as that would be to start on. They let it slide, they don't understand. Develop an above average smile. Develop an above average excitement. Develop an above average interest in other people. Develop an above average intensity to win. See, that'll change everything. Probably one of the most frustrating experiences in life is looking for an above average job with above average pay without becoming an above average person. It's called frustration. And Mr. Shelf gave me probably the greatest clue he gave me when I first met him. He said, Jim, if you want to be wealthy and happy the rest of your life, just learn this lesson well. He said, learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Then Mr. Shelf gave me probably one of the most important clues among so many things he taught me, but this was in those early days. Mr. Schof was very kind, but he was also very abrupt. And he had these interesting questions to ask. I'm giving him a little rundown run one day on how things hadn't worked out for me. He said, Mr. Owen, I've got the answer for you if you will listen carefully. And listen carefully, I did that day and for the next five years. If somebody's wealthy and happy, you got to listen. He said, Jim, I've only known you a short time. But he said, it's already my honest opinion that for things to change for you, you've got to change. That wasn't quite the answer I was looking for. But that's the answer he gave me, and I pass it along to you on this warm summer evening in Anaheim, California, 1981. For things to change for you, you've got to change. Otherwise, it isn't going to change. Before I met Mr. Shelf, I used to say, I sure hope things will change. <laughs> right? That seemed to be my only hope. If it isn't going to change, I'm in serious trouble. And then I discovered it isn't going to change, so I'm in serious trouble. See, I can tell you what the 80s are going to be like. You have dropped into the right place. I did a seminar one time for Standard Oil executives and management in uh, Honolulu. And uh, we're having a conference one day on this big conference table. And one of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, you know some fairly important people halfway around the world. What do you think the 80s are going to be like? I said, gentlemen, I do know the right people. I can tell you. So they all listened very carefully. And I said, gentlemen, based on my wide experience, I can really honestly say to you, in my opinion, in the 80s, it's going to be about like it's always been. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came? That's inside. I don't pass that around just everywhere. <laughs> now, of course, I said that to make a point, but I also said it because it's accurate. It's going to be about like it's always been. It isn't going to change. The tide comes in and then what? It goes out for six and a half thousand years that we know of, recorded history, and probably long before that. So it is not going to change. It gets light and then what? It turns dark. Six and a half thousand years. See, it's not likely to change. And we're not to be startled by that. And if the sun goes down, the guy says, what's happened, what's happened? It means he hasn't been here long, I guess, right? <laughs> it always goes down about this time. <laughs> the guy says, well, I don't like that arrangement. Well, you've got to talk to somebody besides me, right? 
It gets light, then it turns dark. In rotation, the next season after fall is what? Winter. Pray tell how often does winter follow fall? Every year regularly for the last six and a half thousand that we know of. See, it is not going to change. Now, some winters are long, and some are short, and some are hard, and some are easy, but they always come right after falls. It isn't going to change. Sometimes you can figure it out. Sometimes there's no way to figure it out. Sometimes it goes well. Sometimes it gets in a knot. Sometimes it sails along. Sometimes it gets in reverse. See, that's not going to change. The last 6,000 years reads like this. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel. Today we will be discussing the 10 steps to an extraordinary life as shared by Jim Rohn, one of the most influential motivational speakers of all time. Uh, this is a good list that I've put together, inspired by a couple of others and my own contribution, and I'd like to share this list with you. First, learning the power of purpose. A person who has purpose in their life, they have something to go for, some meaning. One writer described it, for some people it becomes a magnificent obsession. And for you and I, maybe it doesn't need to be that dramatic as a magnificent obsession. But it has to be something that does something to us, something that pulls us, especially into the future. You know, there are many influences on us. One is the influence of the past. Some people are always pulled back, back, back by the past. Some people are always pulled aside by the distractions, the distractions. But here's what's powerful. If you have a list of high purpose in your life, it pulls you toward the future. And the more powerful the purpose is, the stronger it pulls. And here's the other great advantage if you have purpose for the future. It pulls you through all kinds of challenges and all kinds of difficulties. If you don't have these strong purposes for the future, it's easy to get swallowed by a bad day. It's easy to be almost annihilated by a poor month. And it's easy sometimes to almost disappear beneath the waves of a, a year that goes backwards if you don't have something to pull you beyond that year. So if you want something to pull you through all kinds of challenges, all kinds of difficulties and things that come at you, You've got to have something on out there, beyond today, beyond next week, beyond next month, beyond this year, that pulls you into the future. And the clearer it is, the stronger it pulls. The more, the more dynamic it is, the more it affects your life, your spirit, your heart, your soul. It also creates imagination. It gets your mind working on how to achieve that purpose. And if your mind will work, and if your heart works, and if your spirit works, and if you have good input, like good ideas, I'm telling you, there isn't anything you can't accomplish. So that's one of the great powers that'll make a variable of you, and that is purpose. Here's the next one, self-confidence. Where does self-confidence come from? And this is the best advice I can give you on that. Not neglecting, first of all, the small daily disciplines. Self-confidence really comes from feeling good about yourself. And one of the best ways to feel good about yourself is at the end of the day to know that you poured it on. You did your best. If you conducted a meeting, you did the best you could. If you made a phone call, it was the best phone call you could possibly make. If you wrote a letter, it wasn't a casual letter, it was your best letter. At the end of those kind of days, when you feel good about yourself, self-confidence starts to rise. You know that if you can have this kind of a good day, you can have another one the next day, and those days become the weeks, the weeks become the months, and the month becomes a powerful year. Self-confidence comes from the lack of neglect. If you will not neglect to do the small daily disciplines, that's where self-confidence comes from. Part of good health is self-confidence. I know I'm going to be healthy. I take the Herbalife products. 
I eat the apple a day. I walk around the block. I do the jogging on the beach. At the end of the day, when you've really poured it on and you've done all the stuff, self-confidence grows. That self-confidence affects your health. It affects your future. It affects your psyche. So this is true. One of the great powers is self-confidence. Self-confidence means willingness to do whatever it takes to achieve. Some people say, well, I'll do it for a little while and see what happens. You know, I'll try a couple of things. If that doesn't work, I'm out of here. And all of us know that that kind of person doesn't have much of a future. But if you're willing to do whatever it takes, if I have to learn a couple of things, I will learn those things. If I got to learn five or six things, I'll learn all six. If I have to take an extra class, I'll take an extra class. If I've got to read the books, I'll read the books. If I have to consult with people who know more than I know, I will do the necessary consulting. Whatever it takes, I will do. That starts to develop unbelievable self-confidence. Self-confidence also comes from the ability to rise above your circumstances, to rise above what happens, the petty little things, the discouraging things that would sink everyone else's ship except yours, that would cause someone else to quit early in the day, but you keep going. That kind of willingness to overcome all circumstances, whether it's the little challenges or the big challenges. If you're willing to do that, I promise you, this kind of power will work for you, and in you, the variable, it'll make a difference. The third on the list I had was enthusiasm. And here's what I wrote about enthusiasm. Enthusiasm that's powerful is mostly enthusiasm that is enthusiasm inside, 90%. 10% outside. We all know what the enthusiasm is like when somebody lets us see their enthusiasm, which is the, like the 90% and only 10% of it is inside. But the enthusiasm that really affects people is not just being loud, but the enthusiasm that runs deep, the enthusiasm that comes from deep inside, created by self-confidence, created by purpose created by genuine willingness to help other people. That kind of enthusiasm, knowing that you're going to get the job done, knowing you're going to affect people, knowing you're going to have testimonials flowing in from all kinds of uh, directions, that kind of enthusiasm. A lot of it is quiet. A lot of it is unheard. And the 10% that's heard, it rings a bell. People call it genuine enthusiasm because they know that what you say in the outward display of your enthusiasm is only a small tip of the iceberg of the enthusiasm you feel inside that really motivates you to do the best job you can. Next on my list to help you become the powerful variable is expertise. Wanting to excel in all of the skills and settling for nothing less than an outstanding performance. If you're willing to be the best in your field, if you're willing to demand of yourself excellence in skills, to be the best that you can possibly be, in the training, do the best you possibly can. In doing a workshop, do the best you possibly can. Developing the skills of using your personality, developing the skills of language, developing the skills of influence, developing the skills of Organizing, if you're willing to be an expert in all of the skills, Herbalife has the way for you to invest those skills and not only make a handsome living, not only make a lot of money, but if you would so desire and if it would be your purpose, a chance to make your fortune. Expertise, excellence in skills. Here was the next one on my list, making a powerful contribution to you, the variable and that is preparation, well prepared. And preparation, of course, involves a whole lot of things. A big share of our life is preparing, getting ready. When we go to the first grade in school, we're just preparing for the second grade. After we've finished two grades, the two grades prepare us for number three. Sometimes it seems like a long, excruciating time, and the time will just seem like it'll never come when we can finally have the performance that we really want. But it takes time to prepare. It takes time to get ready. 
And the decisions you make in the preparation time, those are the decisions that last for a lifetime. Preparing to have a good day. It's that preparing, maybe the night before, maybe the couple of days before the day that you're going to put everything together. The preparation for a meeting means that you've taken it serious. The preparation for doing a workshop means you're serious about the workshop. You want to make the best contribution. That kind of preparation is important. But here's preparation that's very vital, and that is to prepare yourself for success. Life seemingly does not wish to waste success on the unprepared. Life says, why waste a fortune on this person? They're not prepared to do the right things with it. They're not prepared to use it wisely. If a fortune was bestowed upon this unprepared person, it would probably be wasted. The people that could have been touched won't be touched. What could have been done won't be done because this fortune will have been wasted on the unprepared person. So not only look for fortune, not only look for the promise, but prepare yourself and ask of yourself, what can I do to make myself ready? Because remember, life was designed not to give us what we want, not to give us what we uh, need, but life was designed to give us what we deserve. Every value in life must be paid for, and those that pay are the ones that get it. It says those that give receive. Someone says, I wish to receive, I wish to receive. You don't have to concentrate on receiving. Just become a good giver. It says those that search will find. Someone says, well, I need to find some good ideas to help change my life for the future. Then to find good ideas, that doesn't come because you need them. It's because it comes because you search for them. If you want good ideas, you've got to go after them. You've got to go to the class. You've got to go to the workshop. You've got to go to the training. Go to the book, right? You've got to go to the journal, right? Go where good ideas are being taught. Go searching, go looking, because good ideas are not going to be wasted on those that are not seeking, searching, well-prepared. So, prepare yourself to be ready for fortune when it comes, to be ready for challenge when it comes, to be ready for opportunity when it comes. Opportunity comes along and passes by the person that is not well prepared. I want to prepare myself this year for next year. Yes, I wish to be effective this year, but I'm also thinking of ways. How could I be better? How could my ideas be more powerful? How could they be sharper, more clear? When the 10th grade finally comes, now you can cash in and get two times, three times, five times more value from it by being prepared. I want to do my best this year for Herbalife, but I also want to get ready for next year, 1999. And then when the year 2000 comes at the turn of the century, I want to be well equipped by language, by instinct, by temperament, by personality, by influence to really be valuable the year 2000, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's my goal. I'm sure it's your goal. Now here's the next one. There's great power in self-reliance. Self-reliance means you simply look mostly to yourself. It would be nice if someone just gave you this, gave you this, gave you this, it would be nice if everyone did their job exactly as they're supposed to do it. But here's what you've got to do. Primarily rely on yourself. Primarily say, I'm the person responsible. And I will learn the necessary skills so that I can help people learn their skills. If I need lots of people to do certain things to build my organization, that is what I must have. But I've got to be the final backstop. I've got to be the final one that people can rely on. So that if this is missed and this is missed, I can catch up. I can fill the gap. I can do the job. We have to do it when we conduct meetings. We have to do it when we conduct training. We have to do it when we're in a class of just a few. What someone might have missed, we're there to fill in. Self-reliance. Primarily, we're learning to count on yourself. So that you can do this, never complain and never explain. Here's the next key power, and that's image. There's many parts to image. The image that others see you as, the image you have with other people. And it's very important how other people see you. 
If they don't see you as a leader, chances are they won't pay attention. If they don't see you as being in control, chances are they won't have the trust. If they don't see you as knowing where you're going, what you want to accomplish, they probably won't follow. But if people can see you, if you have the image of someone that's in charge, in control, in control of your life, your future, your destiny, in control of the situation, if they see that, that kind of image is powerful. It helps to win the day. It attracts other people. People want to be around people that are in control, that are powerful, but they know how to use their power, influential, but they know how to use their influence. That kind of image is important. But here's a very important image, and that is your image of yourself. The way you dress, the way you talk, the way you think, your capacity for learning. All of that is an important image that you have of yourself. The image that you have that if it needs to be learned, you could learn it. If there's a book that needs to be mastered, you could master it. If there's a skill that needs to be learned, why couldn't you get busy now and learn that skill? That kind of self-image, that I am continually trying my best to be the best I can. Because one of the most important places you have to look is into the future, yes. You've got to look into the past, yes. You've got to look around, yes. But one of the most important places you have to look is in the mirror. You know, how I appear to other people, that's important. But how I appear to myself, is the ultimate importance. That kind of image to where you'll develop the self-confidence, you'll develop the self-reliance. Now here's another one in my rather short list. The next word is character. Becoming a person of high values, a person of principles, a person of honesty, a person that earns respect, that kind of character. It took character when Mark started to put the marketing system together. How can we have a system that will build in the integrity that people will know that if this happens, then this will happen. And if this goes wrong, here's the way to fix it. Unless you have the principles and the character and the integrity to put together a viable plan for a wide variety of people, then the system is not going to last very long. And I've been around long enough, and I'm sure you have been around long enough to see a lot of systems that got started, but they failed. And the reason is because they were not constructed with integrity. They were not constructed with character. They were not constructed with doing the right thing. They might have been constructed to take advantage. You know, cash it out as quickly as possible and leave. Mark was involved when others took advantage of him all those years ago before Herbalife. When someone took advantage and didn't have the character, didn't have the principles, and didn't have the, uh, the character to stay, the character to see it through, the character to do the right thing. So this is important to develop the character within yourself, that people see you as honest, as fair, willing to do the right thing, willing to be helpful, but always willing to walk the center line not to pass the line. When we come to an opportunity like Herbalife, especially uh, multi-level network marketing, it is so dynamic, it is so powerful, and it is so possible in fortune making that sometimes people want to speed up the process by cutting the corners, by neglecting to do the right things, you know, to cheat a little here, cheat a little here, you know, cross the line just a little bit, because then you know, it'll grow faster and you can cash in quicker. Not necessary here. Doing Herbalife right will build your fortune longer and stronger than trying to cut the corners and not doing it right. If, you'll ha if we'll have the integrity that Mark had when he started it and keep perpetuating that, that we will do the right thing by the marketing system, the right thing by uh, a distributor who has a customer and they take care of that customer, that customer belongs to that distributor. That kind of integrity in the marketing system the kind of integrity we have among each other, the kind of character we have to rely on each other, because here's we, what we cannot do. We cannot do this by ourselves. Mark's got to count on me. I've got to count on Mark. 
we've got to count on the president's team. The president's team has to count on uh, the chairman's club for advice and counsel. Uh, we have to count on the millionaire team, the tabulator team, the world team. We've got to count on the distributor. We've got to count on the distributor giving the right message to the potential customer. We've got to count on the distributor giving wise counsel to the new recruit, teaching them the right way, the Herbalife way, the principled way, the character way. Vitally important. Building and developing your own character. Now here's another one. It's called self-discipline. Self-discipline, all of us have a challenge with that. Because sometimes it's easy, and especially if you're working hard, doing the best you can, it's easy sometimes to let up and let it go. But remember, so many people, especially now that we're as big as we are around the world, are counting on what we do. At home office, they have to be careful. They have to be disciplined. It's easy for the person who ships the product from Herbalife says, oh, well, I'll wait until tomorrow to ship it. And then they go home and sleep like a baby. But the distributor who's waiting for that product doesn't sleep that night or doesn't sleep when the product doesn't show on time. But if everybody will have the discipline to say, I will do the best job I can, I will make mistakes, of course, because we're all human, but I'll try to remedy those mistakes and do the best job I can. That kind of self-discipline that understands how important your part is in all of the functions that work. Coming to work on the set here. Uh, HBN, there's so many people that play a part. And each one of the parts that are played is necessary to put on the broadcast, make it viable, make it real, make it powerful. Any couple of them missing, and it would be a disaster. But all of it put together, and it works like a charm. Each person developing the self-discipline to do their part, do their job. Here's one more, and that is the power of extraordinary performance and demanding of yourself excellent results. This is so important. If you want to live extraordinary, you must do extraordinary. If you want an extraordinary income, you must do extraordinary things. If you want an extraordinary fortune, you must go with the demands of what it takes to have that fortune. Mark has made such a fortune, it's almost beyond comprehension what the numbers really are. But guess what he has the satisfaction of knowing? He earned it all. If he'd have been lax in the performance, Herbalife would not be here these 18 years later. Herbalife would have been a footnote in multi-level history. But because he performed year after year, the third year and the fifth year, and the seventh year and the tenth year, and the twelfth year and the fifteenth year, and now performing well in the eighteenth year. I'm telling you, that's what makes it such a viable fortune for Mark personally, of course, because he did the job. If we would ask of ourselves that kind of performance, and you've got to ask it of yourself. You know, I can't ask it of you. I would try to inspire you. I would tr try my best to share with you what it might taste like, what it's like, to finally make your fortune, it happened for me. But here's what you must do, you must demand it of yourself. Society does not demand that you not have a heart attack. But if you want to escape having a heart attack, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you take herbal life and improve your health. You have to demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you jog around the block every morning. Uh, but if you want good health, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you read a couple of books a week and improve your intelligence and your knowledge. That you must demand of yourself. Society does not demand that you build a financial wall around your family nothing can get through. That's not a demand of society. But you must demand it, if you wish it, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you learn a list of ten skills in order to ensure your own future and the future of your family. Society doesn't demand it, doesn't require it. It is not a law. But if you want the benefit, you must demand it of yourself. Success is often viewed as the achievement of a specific goal or outcome, whether it's earning a degree, starting a business, or reaching a certain level of fame or wealth. While these outcomes may be important measures of success, 
they are often the result of mastering the fundamentals, the foundational skills and knowledge that are necessary to achieve any goal. In any field, whether it's athletics, music, or business, the most successful individuals are those who have mastered the basics. This means developing a deep understanding of the underlying principles and techniques, and practicing them consistently until they become second nature. For example, in basketball, the most successful players are those who have mastered the fundamentals of dribbling, shooting, and passing. In business, successful entrepreneurs have a solid grasp of financial management, marketing, and customer service. And in music, the most accomplished performers are those who have spent countless hours practicing scales, chords, and rhythms. Mastering the fundamentals is not only essential for achieving success in a particular field, but it also builds a strong foundation for continued growth and development. Once you have a deep understanding of the basics, you can build upon that knowledge and explore more advanced techniques and concepts. In addition, mastering the fundamentals allows you to be adaptable and flexible in the face of challenges and obstacles. When you encounter a new situation or problem, you can draw upon your foundational knowledge and skills to find creative solutions. In conclusion, while success may be measured by achieving specific goals or outcomes, it is often the result of mastering the fundamentals, the foundational skills and knowledge that are essential for success in any field. By developing a deep understanding of the basics, practicing them consistently, and building upon that knowledge, you can achieve your goals and continue to grow and develop throughout your life. To a lot of people, ambition is kind of a mystery. The dictionary says it's an eager desire for distinction, power, or fame. But what does that really mean? Well, let's start with the word eager. All by itself, eager is kind of exciting. Kids are eager for their birthday parties. They expect to be the center of attention, get lots of presents, eat too much. I guess grown-ups are eager for birthdays, too. Unless, of course, they're embarrassed that the number of candles on the cake outnumber their achievements. But we can be eager to see a ball game, eager to see our kids in a dance recital, eager to see an old friend, eager to shop for a new car. Eager sounds like a lot of fun. But do you ever hear people say they are eager to live a better life, eager to have a better family, Eager to make a lot of money? Probably not. And that's a problem. Because how I see it, living a better life, having a better family, and making a lot of money takes an eager desire. We have the remarkable ability to get exactly what we must have. But there is a difference between wishes and desires. We've all heard people say, oh, I wish I could just drop five pounds. I want to be a little lighter. And we've probably said it ourselves, especially after a big holiday dinner of turkey and homemade pie and every other thing we can possibly stuff ourselves with in one eight-hour period of time. And even though we may wish we could breathe a little easier in our clothing, we have to have the desire to exercise a little more and eat a little less. The I wish I could lose weight has to become I have the eager desire to lose weight. I'm also sure you've heard people talk about wishing they had more money to pay the bills, or take a vacation, or just to take a little pressure off of life. But before their lifestyle can change, their wish needs to become a desire. If they really desired change, they wouldn't spend their evenings just watching TV and wishing they were doing something more. The backbone of an eager desire to change is discipline. True ambition is disciplined, eager desire. It's that little part within us that says, if I want to be ready for that meeting tomorrow, I need to finish preparing for it today. If I want to make sure I can pay for my kid's college education, I need to start saving today. If I want a better life tomorrow, I need to start working on it Today, ambition is a minute-by-minute, day-by-day mentality.
To have the ambition to work towards a better family life, a newer car, a bigger house, a financially secure future, you have to live it every moment. If living a successful life was easy, I'm sure more people would be successful. If just being ambitious was enough, I'm sure all of the broke and perplexed people in the world wouldn't be broke and perplexed. While most people spend most of their lives struggling to earn a living, a much smaller number seem to have everything going their way. Instead of just earning a living, the smaller group is busily working at building and enjoying a fortune. Everything just seems to work out for them. And here sits the much larger group, wondering in awe on how life can be so unfair, complicated, and unjust. So what's the major difference between the little group with so much and the larger group with so little? Despite all the factors that affect our lives, like the kind of parents we have, the schools we attended, the part of the country we grew up in, none has as much potential power for doing good as the ability to dream. Dreams are a projection of the kind of life we want to lead. Dreams can drive you. Dreams can make you skip over obstacles. When we allow our dreams to pull us, they unleash a creative force that can overpower everything in our way. To unleash this power, though, your dreams must be well-defined. A fuzzy future has little pull power. Well-defined dreams are not fuzzy. Wishes are fuzzy. To really achieve your dreams, to really have your future plans pull you, your dreams must be vivid. One of the issues Mr. James dealt with in his lifetime was, what does it mean to be a success, a significant person? After years of pondering this question, William James described success as a combination of two things. Number one, an inner ideal which is followed persistently with courage. And number two, outer achievement related to that ideal. Let's go back to number one, an inner ideal which is followed persistently with courage. I take that to mean defining a goal and having the resolve to complete it. No matter what, I'll do it or die. Promise yourself you'll read the books until your skills change. Go to the seminars until you get a handle on it. Do it until it makes sense. Practice it until you've got it right. Don't give up until you get where you want to be, however long that is. Step by step, piece by piece, book by book, seminar by seminar, do it until. Go for it. Until is a very important word. It's magic. It means that you'll never give up. Don't miss the chance to grow, to pay the price, until you learn change, grow. You'll discover some of life's great treasures when you pay that price. William James' second part to success dealt with the outer achievement related to that ideal. You need both aspects to really be a success. But what Dr. James realized about his philosophy of success was that the first part is indeed more important than the second. Going for it. As long as you're working toward your inner goal, your dream, then success is possible. But once you give up your inner vision, then you can never become successful. You never will become successful. Until doesn't even matter. Now, maybe the person who's been working on a project for 10 years can be successful in his own right. If he's honestly working toward it, doing everything, to make himself worthy of reaching the dream. Really happy with where he is, doing it until. Then maybe he is a success. It's a personal thing, going for it one step at a time. Going for small accomplishments along the way for however long it takes. 
So let's think about this for a moment. What outside evidence or results or proof can be seen when you accomplish your goals one step at a time? You'll start to see things change around you, little things, not major things, but little everyday things, things you may not even notice unless you are paying attention. If you're one of those who'd rather stay up late and get up late, only to discover that your workplace doesn't fit your schedule, and you roll out of bed cursing the alarm clock every morning, maybe you could start with the little change of going to bed half an hour earlier than normal. And maybe you'll see, in time of course, you can't train your body overnight, maybe you'll find out that you jump out of bed in a better mood, and that your day will start better, and that you'll get more done, and that the people around you that caused you problems aren't so hard to work with after all. It all starts by making one little change and adding to it every day. You see, you can't change what's going on around you without first changing what's going on within you. Start changing how you look at mornings, and sure enough, people will start changing how they look at you. When you start changing how you think, how you act, how you treat others, how you treat yourself, when you start responding instead of reacting to life, life will start responding to you. I'm telling you that you can do it with your lifestyle. You can do it with your sales career. You can do it with your management career. You can do it with any part of your life. The first six years of my economic life, I wound up broke. Second six years, I wound up rich. Someone says, don't you have to do the second six years like you did the first six years and jot this down. No. No, you don't have to live the second six years like the first six. You can use all the information and all the advice and repairing all of your mistakes and adopting a new and refined philosophy so that the next six years can be totally different than the last six. No other life form can do this. See, if you were a tree, you'd be stuck. As a tree, if you used up all the nourishment that was around you and you couldn't change location, see, you would die. But that's not true. Human beings can change location, go north, south, east, west, live here for a while, live somewhere else for a while. So that's a note to make. You can greatly alter the course of your life. Now, here's the next note to make. Five years from now, you will arrive. The question is where? If you keep up your present disciplines and keep up the present pace that you're on, where will you be in five years? Boy, it's easy to say, hey, I haven't really thought about that. So now make this note. In five years, here's the probability. You will either arrive at a well-designed destination or an undesigned destination. And I promise you, five years from now, you really don't want to arrive at an undesigned destination because you may very well wind up wearing what you don't want to wear, driving what you don't want to drive, living where you don't want to live, maybe doing what you don't want to do, simply because you didn't design a better destination. Now, sometimes after we've lived a few years now to repair our mistakes and get back on track, seems like a tough job. If you start early, the fortune belongs to you. If you start early, all fortunes that are available to humans, if you start early, the promise looms large and the odds are heavy in your favor. Now, yes, it's possible to do some radical things starting late and still arrive with some good treasures and some good things. But when you haven't got that much time left, now sometimes the decision has to be so drastic people are not willing to make it and they're too tired and too weary and too ill and say, look, I don't have much time left. It's not gonna happen for me anyway. It's easy to take that attitude. But everyone here, we've got the time over the next 10 years. We've got the time the next 20 years. We've got the time the next 30 years to make some repair now in our errors of the past and set up some new disciplines. And I'm telling you, that's gonna change everything. So five years from now, I wish for you to arrive at a well-designed place. 
a place of productivity, a place that'll make you feel good about yourself, a place that'll give you honor and respect, a place that'll give you influence to touch other people five years from now that you couldn't do today. Where will you be in five years? Key phrase, we go the direction we face. If you start designing something at the end of this direction, sure enough, you will start going the direction you face. And we face the direction we design. Direction determines destination. Destination is not determined by hope. It's not determined by wish. Destination is determined by direction. You cannot change destination overnight. But here's what you can change today and overnight. You can change direction. And it is so fascinating what a little small change of direction will do. A few decisions in discipline, a few decisions in learning, a few decisions in change of behavior, change of habit, a few decisions in setting goals that you've sort of let drift before. Like I did at age 25, didn't have a list. I immediately started to change that. And I immediately started to change my direction so that very quickly I started heading this direction. In less than seven years, I was a millionaire. We must all suffer one of two things, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret or disappointment. Let others lead small lives, but not you. Let others argue over small things, but not you. Let others cry over small hurts, but not you. If you really want to do something, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. Be strong, but not rude. Be kind, but not weak. Be proud, but not arrogant. You don't get paid for the hour. You get paid for the value you bring to the hour. I find it fascinating that most people plan their vacations with better care than they plan their lives. Perhaps that is because escape is easier than change. The ultimate reason for setting goals is to entice you to become the person it takes to achieve them. Time is more valuable than money. You can get more money but you cannot get more time. Excuses are the nails used to build a house of failure. The things that change your life are the people you meet, the classes you take, and the books you read. The worst thing one can do is not to try to be aware of what one wants and not give in to it, to spend years in silent hurt wondering if something could have materialized, never knowing. Success is nothing more than a few simple disciplines practiced every day. If you don't like how things are, change it. You're not a tree. No one else makes us angry. We make ourselves angry when we surrender control of our attitude. If you are not willing to risk the unusual, you will have to settle for the ordinary. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Poor people have big TVs. Rich people have big libraries. You cannot change your destination overnight, but you can change your direction overnight.
Self-preparation leads to control over your life. Whenever you prepare correctly, taking all of the steps you're supposed to take, doing everything in your power to stay on track, whenever your preparations lead to success, achieving your goals, you reinforce the disciplines that got you there. Success leads to reinforcement of the proper disciplines. If what you're doing is working, keep doing it. If what you're doing isn't working, change it. When you are doing all that you can possibly do and are successful at reaching your expectations, keep doing it. Success is a reinforcement. Psychologists call this positive reinforcement. We all know about positive reinforcement. That's how we train our dogs. That's how we teach our kids. That's how the trainers at SeaWorld can get a killer whale to do tricks and follow commands and work side by side with humans by positive reinforcement. When you bring a brand new puppy home and try to teach him not to mess in the house, what do you do? You reward him for going outside or scratching at the door. When you're trying to get your toddler out of the diaper stage, what do you do? You reward her with special presents, make her feel special for learning something new. When you're trying to get your older kids to crack the books and study, what do you do? You reward them when they get good grades. You teach them that the skills they are developing now will have great positive effects on their lives later. But you reward them now. This is positive reinforcement. Learning that there are rewards for doing something good, something worthwhile, something of value. The greater the value, the greater the reward. The better you do, the better your reward. The greater the value, the greater the reward. A bigger paycheck, a better house, financial freedom. It's all a reward system. Now, there are two major benefits of positive reinforcement. Number one, positive reinforcement builds good habits. If what you are doing, the habits you've gotten into, are building your ambition and increasing your success, keep doing them. Your success is reaffirming that these habits are good. Your success tells you that you need to keep doing what you are doing. By reviewing these habits that bring on success, you reinforce them, give them sticking power. Now here's the other side. By reviewing your habits, you may find out that some of them are inhibiting your success. You may find out that what you're doing every day is bad for you or going are now part of your philosophy. How do you know when you're successful? Do you have to be a millionaire? No. All we ask of you is that you earn all you possibly can. If you earn 10,000 a year and that's the best you can do, that's enough. God and everything else will see to it that you're okay. The key is to just do the best you can. If it's 10,000 a year, wonderful. If it's 100,000 a year, wonderful. If it's a million a year, wonderful. It doesn't matter 10,000 a year or a million a year. It doesn't matter as long as you've done the best you possibly can. Earn the most you possibly can. Be the most you possibly can. And here's why. The essence of life is growth. The essence of life is growth, to do the best you can. And here's what's interesting. Humans are the only life form that will do less than they possibly can. Humans are the only life form that will settle for less. Every other life form except human beings strive to its maximum capacity. How tall will a tree grow? Approximately. As tall as it possibly can. You never heard of a tree growing half as high as it could. No, trees don't grow half. Trees send their roots down as deep as possible, stretch their limbs up as high as possible, produce every leaf possible and every fruit possible. As a matter of fact, you never heard of a human physically growing half. We keep growing until we're done. Now that's a part of life we can't control. It's genetically coded. And that's probably why we keep growing till we're done because we can't control that part. 
It's the rest of our growing that we control. The growing of our minds, the expansion of our minds, that we can control. And that's what tends to get away from us. All life forms inherently strive to their max except human beings. Now, why wouldn't human beings strive to their maximum possibility? Here's why. Because we've been given the dignity of choice. It makes us different than alligators and trees and birds. The dignity of choice makes us different than There's your achievements. How can you isolate what's working for you and what isn't? How can you make sure that you are reinforcing your positive disciplines? Well, if it isn't apparent, easy to see right away. If what you're doing is happening in such small increments that you're not sure if you're on track, then you need to be writing it down. You need to keep a journal anyway. But if you really aren't sure that what you're doing is making measurable progress, you need to to get the most from a day, to learn the most from a day, you need to be able to reflect on the day. And how can you reflect on a day unless you record it in history? How can you possibly reflect on a week unless you can look back and analyze it? How can you learn from past mistakes and bask in the past successes unless you write it all down? There's something magical in writing out a problem. It's almost as though a way to make them better. It's all part of being responsible. 